Fantastic. Well, good evening. Um, I would like to call the Randolph Technical Career Center uh, board meeting to order. Our first order of business is to welcome any guests that may be here. Looking around, I see all friendly faces. So we will move right on and turn the meeting over to Felicia to talk about staffing, programs, and facility updates. Sure, sure. So um, let me just turn on my camera so you can all see me. Here we are. Um, so this year we had another year with a fair amount of turnover. And um, we welcome to our staff Greg Hans, who is our pre-tech exploratory instructor. Um, he was a local electrician in the area, but also a school teacher. Um, Clint Wild, who is our culinary arts and hospitality instructor. He comes to us from the, oh, what's it called? It's right in the corner in, in Barry. Cornerstone. Cornerstone. Yeah, that makes sense. Right. Cornerstone. Um, so he was the chef there. Uh, Christy Arguin, who is our new special needs coordinator, and she comes to us from Williamstown. Um, Peter Boucher, who is our electrical technology instructor. Uh, Jenny Engel, our mathematics instructor. She actually did our long-term subbing position last year, loved it, and is going to get her um, license and, and wants to be a math teacher. TJ Sheltra is our English and Humanities instructor. He also did a long-term subbing stint with us last year and stayed on with us. We have Randy Clark who has come back to our district to be a mechanical core aide for diversified agriculture and automotive. We have Marie Conley who is our CTE school counselor for one year while Jen Joles is taking one year leave of absence. We have Brian Kippen, who is our new industrial design and fabrication instructor. And currently, the one position that is outstanding is our dental position. Um, I was lucky enough to secure an amazing dentist, Lydia Gleason, who is filling in. She would be qualified to teach the program if she accepts the position. It's, it, we're in negotiations right now, <laughs> so. Um, but sh she really wants to get out into the clinical world, so I'm not sure if that's gonna happen, but we'll talk about that maybe at this point. The, the drawback for this position is that it requires the person to have a CDA, which is the dental assisting licensure, plus a bachelor's. And if you know anything about that field, most people that have a CDA or a dental assisting license do not generally have a degree. Um, so that's a little challenging and is presenting us with some problems. So we're going to have to figure out what our plan is if, uh, if Lydia decides not to accept the position and we can't find a qualified candidate. The funds for that position are through a time grant, so that does not cover long-term subbing, so therefore it is more than likely that the program would need to close for a year until we could regroup. And, uh, and get that back up and running. We have is it five or six young ladies in the program who are super excited to be there. So I really, really would hate for that to be the option that we end up having to go with. And we have reached out to every... Um... Licensed CDA in Vermont. Yep. Yep. <laughs> we wrote them cold, cold letters just saying, what, what you doing? Um, so we'll see how that pans out. Um, so that's staffing updates. Um, really positive start to the year. I think our staff are really excited to be working together. Kids came back ready to learn. Um, so no new programs. All the programs that we had last year are what we have this year. And no major facilities updates other than the dental lab. That was the, the big one this summer. Um, and I think with that, that's probably good on that subject. Can I have keep? a question, yeah. though. So if the dental program was ceased to exist on this campus, um, could those four or five students enroll in, a, in another program at another school? They, no. could, they could either return to their partner school or they could elect to choose a different program that has openings at the tech center. And there are a few of those as well. Mm -hmm. um, as far as other dental programs, there's only one other one for their age group, and it's up in Essex. So I thought Essex. Yeah. So that would be kind of a hike for them. Okay. Mm -hmm. Question, thank you. Any other questions on that piece? So the, the <laughs> dental lab is complete now? The dental lab is complete and operational. But we just need an instructor. Now we need an instructor, <laughs> yes. Okay, cool. 
Is there any other recruiting methods that you could use to get the information out there? I mean, that you're face, looking Facebook for? would be wonderful mm -hmm. um, to be able to get a little bit more out there. That way, we, um, like we said, we wrote some letters to mm -hmm. all the licensed CDAs in Vermont. So, uh, I mean, aside from looking for the New Hampshire ones, I suppose that's an option as well. There were some or New Hampshire ones on the list. Was yeah. there? Okay. I was just thinking if anybody's looking to relocate to the area, maybe. I mean, you got a great Glad video um, teacher from Ohio, is Lance from? Yeah, Wyoming. Yeah, Wyoming. Wyoming. So yeah. do we need to branch out a little bit in the surrounding states with some yeah. either social media advertising or yep. letters to see if anybody wants to relocate up here? I did reach out to the Dental Association. They were putting feelers out as well. So cool. I'm trying all okay. these different avenues. We'll see if they pan mm -hmm. out. But. Perfect. What type of hoops? Do we have to, does one have to jump through to change the criteria? Well, it's an interesting question, Sam. It's really about the accreditation, and it's not so much about the qualifications to be a tech teacher. Um, Lydia would meet that, and many of the CDAs in the area would meet that. But for the CODA approval for the program, in order for kids to actually get CDA approved or licensed, that those are the requirements of that. So that's, that's above, above me. Above. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I was I was thinking too. Um, one of the questions that it, it sounds like we're meeting meeting with Ruth tomorrow um, or some sometime Monday, again this week yeah. Monday. Um, it might be worth asking if uh, those requirements are as stringent as they are because of the fact that it's grant funded. Sometimes the federal grants um, have pretty explicit ties about high, what high quality means in terms of the person that you hire. Right. So there might be a way to shift that funding to a different program, put the dental program under the regular budget, and then the requirements may not be as stringent. Okay, yeah, um, and that's, and that's and an option. I'm glad you mentioned it because it triggered, triggered that thought. And the other thought that I had, too, was <clears throat> the kids need to walk away with either a Tier 2 credential or they need to have dual enrollment opportunities. Yeah. I'm not sure why, if that's how strict we need to be with that. I mean, granted, we want our kids to get the CDA, so that's that's the ultimate goal. But if it meant getting the program up and running, could we do that for a couple of years and then move into the accreditation process? Yeah. So, yeah. but my my guess is, if this were locally locally funded, it may not be a stringent. It would not be an issue. Yeah. You're, yeah. Yeah. I think. But it's, it, worth, it's worth talking to Ruth. It definitely is. <clears throat> um, can we just move on to the next agenda? That'd be great. Thank you. All right. Uh, recruitment, enrollment, and retention. So uh, currently, do you have a current number? It's 166 students. 166 students. We started the year with 177. To put that into context, two years ago when I began, we started with 105. Um, we are maxing out. A lot of our programs are just about at capacity, which is awesome. Um, but our building is also maxing out in that capacity, <laughs> so that's the stretch. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit when I go through my next, when I go through the CLNA report about um, needs that are industry needs for programming, but we just do not have the facility space for. So, um, we are gearing up right now to get into recruitment for next year, believe it or not. Um, that starts pretty early, and so, in October, we'll start heading out. Uh, our food truck is up and running, and it's at the Tunbridge Fair this weekend. So that'll be fun. I'm excited to see it there. That's another little strategy. Um, but at the same time, we're hoping to take that to the partner schools again, like we did last year, and feed the kids, feed the sophomores, and talk to them about our programs. So we're going to up our game a little bit this year. So that's great. Yeah. So before we go on, any questions on recruitment or retention? So keep on going, Felicia. Okay. All right, let's see. Uh, professional development focus. So we have uh, quite a few things that we're working on this year. I think the major one for the center is to continue to align our programs to the state proficiencies that have been accepted for CTE. And so we're doing scope and sequence, which we started last spring, and we're going to be working on that through PD time this year. We're also, as a staff, going to be looking at mental health first aid. So every staff member will be able to assist kiddos, and um, it just became obvious last year with the needs that were out there that we needed this training. 
Um, so those are two major focuses. And Gary, do you want to chime in? I'm forgetting something. Okay. All right. So um, without further yeah. ado, this part is going to be a little bit long, so I'm going to just apologize. Um, I'm going to take over the screen and display. That's all right. Everybody able to see that? Yes. Okay. So <clears throat> the comprehensive local needs assessment is required by every tech center in order to apply for Perkins funding, which is about 125000 for our school. And it's also a really good way for us to just look at things that are going well, uh, what programs are of quality, areas we need to improve. Um, and so this is a pretty in-depth process. That's why I'm only getting to present this to you now. Um, but I want to just kind of hit the highlights of what we found from this process. So student performance is one of the things that they ask us to look at. And I think if you look at some of the stats to the left, 100% um, of our kids do graduate. And 96% um, of those have a good post-secondary plan or placement where our weaknesses are are in the academics and that's something that i know we noted last year in our board meetings and it continues to be a challenge uh, only 23 percent of our students are proficient in ela and 28 percent in math and only 10 percent in science and i guess just to kind of tell you some of the things we've done already to remedy this the State of Vermont has adopted for all tech centers the Work Keys curriculum, which will be integrated into our ELA and our math programs. That is um, a very systemat systematic math program that kids can take an initial test. They can test out of areas they already are proficient in, but it takes them through work that in the areas that they are not proficient in. Um, so there's that piece that we've implemented. Um, we also have science being integrated into our programs um, this year. So we're hoping that will help. Um, but again, that's an area that needs to continue to be looked at. And just as a reminder, with 165 uh, students, we have one English teacher and one math teacher. So you can guess where I'm going with that one eventually. So we're going to need some staffing. Um, most of our kids, so just before I change slides, a lot of our kids are in Tier 2 IRCs in many programs. Um, and then post-secondary credits, we have about 69 college credits that were issued last year, um, but that was within three programs, so not necessarily across the board. What were the three programs? Oh, did I say it here? No. Um, I did not. It was Education Services. Criminal justice and cybersecurity, and health careers. All right. Um, so, also with student performance, you know, they're looking at our non traditional student rate. Um, we've always prided ourselves in having a, a pretty good rate for uh, females in programs that are non traditional to their gender. Uh, what is very clear is that we haven't really put as much effort and, and work into getting boys into programs that are non-traditional to them. So that would be like health careers, dental assisting, and education. Um, so those are some areas where we need to think about our strategies a little bit and um, making sure that they have the opportunities that the girls are having. We do have middle school girls in for a challenge day, which is put on by Vermont Works for Women. We also had a summer camp last summer. It's the first time in I don't know how many years, um, which was a hit and allowed kids to try different career paths. Um, in terms of special populations and students from different genders, races, and ethnicities, the data shows that as far as classroom performance, they're, they're keeping at par with, with their peers. Um, where there is a discrepancy is 
in the academic testing. When they take a work keys test, you can see that there is significantly lower scores. And um, so that's an area where I'm concerned because we need to figure out where the, where the discrepancy is in terms of what they're learning in program and the test. So something we'll be needing to look at. Uh, the labor market is one of the areas that we study as well for this, and that is just to ensure that our programs are in line with what the industry needs are. And in doing the labor market research, it was very clear that every program that we offer has a growing industry. Um, so that's everything from education, culinary, health and dental, all the way to advanced manufacturing. The one with the highest level of growth is actually culinary. So something to think about. Um, so I think we're doing a really good job kind of keeping our programs in line with what's needed um, for our community. I don't feel we have any programs that are not, which is a great thing. That's one of the things they're looking for. Um, they also want to know that there are actually positions in the industry for these uh, pathways. And so you do a quick Indeed search and you can see that for every one of these pathways there are positions available. The one area of our labor market where we do not have a program is the plumbing and HVAC. And frankly, we don't have space for it. I don't know where we would put it right now. Um, so it's a bit of a dilemma. But that is one program that I think is a need in our local economy, and we can't provide that. Um, Students that, um, one of the questions asked, you know, students in industry that are thriving, what, what were the things that they did in their time with us? And the thing that we've noted is that the kids that participate in the CTSOs and the work-based learning placements who obtain the industry credentials, who obtain college credits, those are the kids that are out there thriving um, because they have those professional skills that they're needed. Um, so. I think that's important, and it's a good reason why it's really important that every program has these opportunities for kids. So I think all of our 12 programs meet the qualifications. Um, and again, we've already talked about dental, so. Um, program size, scope, and quality. This asked our teachers to take a look at their programs and reflect on a lot of different factors. And um, one of the major things that was obvious through all of the work that I sifted through is obviously enrollment has increased from 105 in 2020 to 170 this fall, many programs near capacity. And um, there aren't any real areas that are declining. So I, I think we're in a good place there. Um, Dental, just a reminder that it is grant funded, and so that's part of the reason why we're not sure where that's going to go at this moment. Um, wait lists really only exist in a few programs at this moment. Auto is at capacity and has a wait list. Diesel did, um, I believe they're near capacity now with some ads this week. Um, health careers, electrical, and construction. Those are the, the five programs that regularly max capacity. Um, so I think the point here is, you know, in order to meet the needs of the kids that are coming here, we're, we're getting to the point where we almost need to expand. Um, and so just something to kind of put out there as we think about facilities. One thing that we talked about last year, which was clear it was going to be outside of our budget at that time, was a building out back that would house construction, a new plumbing program, and um, electrical. Now that was like a five million dollar project and so we kind of put the brakes on that for the moment. Um, one other thing that was brought to my attention is when the building was initially designed, it was designed to be a two-story building. Um, so it actually has the structural capacity to have a second floor on it and the RTCC wing. And we could potentially put um, the academics and the programs that do not have shops upstairs and that would also give us capacity mm -hmm. if we stay in this building. If, so. Um, On, uh, if you have to do a second building, is the campus all zoned and everything for that? The second, oh, a yeah. building out back? Yeah. 
I don't know how far we got with that. We had plans drawn up, but I don't know. That's kind of in the facility's hands as far as yeah. that piece of there it. There was a building there at one point, right? There was, yes. The so old Raven building was the there. Old Raven building. They, they hadn't done the... I forgot what they call it, the water... Soil assessment. Mm -hmm. Water runoff surveys. Anytime you have, um, you're, you're taking up space where water can't get into the ground, there's a special survey. That was done, but I don't know if that's all that would be required at this point. I'd have to talk with Bob and Les, the facilities. There, there's such a need for the trades. Would there be any grant money or businesses that would put money towards building such a facility? So the the possibility, since the question came up, we're just going to talk a little bit about it at the superintendent's report, is we're in an interesting place kind of in the state, um, right? There was the study group that got together um, to take a look at the buildings across the state, see what condition they're in, and, and um, for the legislature to come back, hopefully this this set this session and decide, hey, you know, we've got some real needs here. This is an approximate amount of money that we need to put aside to help, you know, kind of subsidize some of the work that needs to happen across the state. So the hope is, is that that happens. Um, and that, in our case, um, is a good thing for two other reasons. One is because we will be going through our PCB testing that's required um, in October. And we have two buildings that are old enough to require testing. Um, that have a likelihood anything that's earlier than you know 1978 or 79 whenever it is is probably has the PCBs in it and that's this building complex and that's Brookfield um, and so we're going to have some information about that that might push us in the direction of new construction um, the other piece that was interesting is when they did the study they rated this building as close to the end of its useful life um, again, they were very good to point out that, yeah, if, if folks are doing proper maintenance, replacing things they need to, you can keep stuff going in indefinitely. But as far as the state was concerned, they rated this building in the state as the one that is the closest to the end of its useful life. So if we put those three things together, um, what we may be looking at, and I'm starting the discussion tomorrow night with uh, the, the community at the Open Forum, is, um, you know, if, if, if we're looking at potentially getting some matching funding from the state, um, can we look at rebuilding this complex? Um, you know, that will allow them to have their building and trade center. Um, it will allow us to modernize uh, this building. There are some other things that have been on the agenda that folks have been talking about as we're building our science program is it would allow potentially for a STEM academy to build, be built. And because we're central in the state and this is a little bit more high flying, um, we're a perfect location to do state championships and things athletically, so it would be nice to have a rub core and a turf field with lights um, and have people come in. We put up the big fences around it, and you know we charge the people the $15 entrance fee to come in and, and, and use the site, which is what happens in most states. So those are the, the kinds of things that we're discussing. So there is the potential um, yep. for a, a new, new building. Um, tomorrow it's just to get the initial appetite of the community for the possibility. Yeah. Well, it's pretty cool with being centrally located. It's not just for sports, but for any academic. And yeah, conferences, but even just having kids come up from White River or Barry Montpelier, it's just yeah. so nicely centrally located. So the, the STEM STEM Academy, if it were a separate building, um, you know, again, high-flying ideas. We've mm -hmm. talked about the possibility that, yeah, it's, it's a classroom space, but maybe it's also a museum um, where other towns can send their kids to kind of come in, you know, get some STEM activities done, and also maybe have a little conference center there as well because we're central. So, okay. yeah. cool. How many more um, students would be able to come in with an addition of a new building? Double. Well, it depends what it depends what we're talking. Right. I mean, well, I, you can build anything you want. I, right. I, I can are, fill it. Like, I think. What, are we shooting we, for a number or just still in the early stages? I mean, I think. Given what I'm seeing for the rates of increase, I mean, I think we're going to flatten out here at some point soon, but I think we easily could have 200 kids uh, with a plumbing program added, and I think that would probably be adequate to keep us sustained and not, you know, having programs, not having programs compete against each other. Right. And tuition, too. There's a balance where kids you get the right and balance out tuition. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Okay. Is your plan to... Sorry. Typically, how long do these construction projects take? Five to ten years, depending upon. I have not worked in Vermont. Um, Massachusetts, when I was there, had the SBA, the School Building Authority, which would help fast track things. 
And you would do it in phases, probably. Uh, potentially, it depends upon you know site location. You know, it's it's difficult to maintain a working site and you know renovate and build in the same location. But we do have the fields out back, so one of the possibilities, depending upon what the studies come back and tell us, is that maybe we build a new building out there while this one is still in operation. Once it's complete, the kids move over. We take this down, and the athletic fields are now here on this end. Yeah. yeah. So mm. cool. I was just going to ask you, are you planning to do a feasibility study on second floor over there? I'm, I'm holding off on anything till, I, till October when we have the, the walkthrough. I, I don't want to plan or dream big until I know what I'm dreaming. Sure. <laughs> so, and we'll see what, how this study comes out. And then if it comes out positive and we're able to stay in the building, um, then yes, I would want to move in some direction to get some more space. It seems like that would be a faster solution in the short term. Yep. But if the building's going to come down in a couple of years, I don't want to put that money yeah, in. That's, that's the I think the I think the PCB testing is going to give us a lot of information. Yeah. Sure. Really point us in the direction. Yeah. yeah. When do we expect to get the PCB? Um, it's it's mid October. It's either the, around the fifteenth or the twentieth, if I remember. Um, they seem to be turning it around pretty quick. Okay. Uh, so we would probably know by by, by mid November. I would I would guess. Um, we're just getting started on it this fall. We've already got a couple of schools that were identified. I've been reading about them in the press. This is so. a pretty priority issue for the feds, right? Yeah. yeah. For the state, yeah. All right. Shall I continue? Sorry about that. That's all right. Hey, I've, no, done I mean, I've done my super I don't, I don't love talking this much, so I was I'm happy to have a break, actually. Um, Wait, I have one more question. Sure. About the science. Yes. So you said the language arts and the um, math are not at proficiency in and science is lowest, mm -hmm. and you have one math teacher and one English teacher, and, and we have and no Vicky science Johnson teachers. Johnson coming over from the high school to integrate math in um, to the programs. So the RU kids, it's required, but so there, but there's the no science teacher. Teacher? teacher. There's no science teacher at there's all. No science teacher. That was in the Perkins plan for this year. And we'll just see because I have to. It, it may actually be the most the best year to do it because I need to put 30 percent of the Perkins plan towards academics because it's an area that needs improvement. One of, one of the issues that, that was encountered, there was a lot of discussion that was led in this particular forum last year, is that you know you got a three three and a half million dollar budget total for RTCC when you hire a staff member between salary and benefits it's 100, 120 thousand. <laughs> it's a huge impact on tuition. And so what they did was a good thing um, a couple of years back was trying to get the academics and teach the academics here. But the problem that they have, and Felicia can speak to it better than I can, is you got 166 kids that have, all need English, you got one teacher to do it. That's about double you know, what the caseload should be. Um, same thing for um, math and the problem with science. Why it's so critical is when the 11th graders come over here and don't have um, science. They miss out a year, on a year of science that all the other students get before they take the science exam in, in 12th grade, the Vermont Science Assessment. And so that's one of the things that we've been working on from the high school side is, hey, they're missing a year of science, yet they take that Vermont Science um, Assessment in 11th grade. How do we make up that year? Um, so it's, it's been a little problematic. But if they can get the staffing, it'll be great to teach it here. But the problem is, is we don't want to double our tuitions because then People well, the yeah, people are supposed to prevent them from coming, but they won't come, and I would get why. Yeah. The good thing about mm. putting academic positions in Perkins is that they can remain there for as long as no. we need to improve, which is probably forever, <laughs> right? Because you always can improve. Yeah. Your targets are always going to get higher. Um, so if we were to put those in the Perkins plan, that seems like a a logical thing to do. Cause we just got to get more Perkins money. We, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Not sure how to do that. Um, so I'll continue. Anyways, so we had um, three programs that were highlighted by the state as not meeting the state or federal requirements, which means that they needed to offer either a Tier 2 IRC or a college course, and the programs offered neither. I think a lot of that was due to the staff turnover last year. We had a lot of new staff members who were just getting their feet on the ground and weren't qualified to teach a dual enrollment class and we're trying to figure out this whole what's the difference between a tier one and tier two IRC which is relatively new to us. Um, 
So this year, our focus will be to make sure that every program does have one or the other. Um, also, whoopsie, am I going forwards or backwards? I guess I'd... That's the same slide you were on. I thought so. <laughs> like, wait a minute. All right. Um, so one of the questions looks at program of studies and meaning everything from when the kids are in middle school all the way through post-secondary and career. And we're working on obviously the middle school piece by offering summer camp to get kids to have that career study you know, ahead of time or career exposure. We also do have um, the challenge day, which is for middle school girls that come, they come in and explore careers. And um, I think the pre-tech exploratory program has been a major boost to our, our kids understanding what programs are the right fit for them. Um, all of our programs definitely offer tier one IRCs, which is things like OSHA or first aid, things that you would assume are like introductory level to go into a career, not necessarily program specific. Um, where we just need to grow is the tier twos. Um, so our hope is to have all 12 programs by 2024 have that. And the reason I say 2024 is because I'm including dental. Dental would not have a tier two IRC until it's CODA approved, which would not be until the spring of 2024. So, um, so there's some talk in the study about um, second year programming and second year retention. And I would say that generally speaking, because we're a full day center, the second year spots are somewhat limited. So kids that do return to us for a second year, that may be two to four spots in a program out of 16. And more than likely, at least in many programs, if they're a successful program, they do work-based learning. They come in for their academics and um, uh, lost my, their senior project or senior portfolio. But I think we have some programs where kids come back a second year, and I'm not sure that the second year programming is as strong, so that's an area to work on. I think that needs to be really um, strategically planned, and it needs to look different than a student's first year. When kids come back, do you see a shift in interest in taking different you know, studies? Um, where someone might come in the first year for building trays, they, they shift their interest to automotive, for example. Yeah, do you see that a lot, or do yeah, you? Yeah, we do. I mean, a lot of times kids will try to figure out the pathways that are related to their interests and kind of where they're heading. So for example, if a student knew they wanted to design cars, they might spend a year in auto and maybe a year in our uh, industrial fabrication and design program. So they could understand you know, both the computer design piece of it, mm -hmm. but also you know, the Mechanical. mechanics of a car, yeah, right. how, it, how it actually runs. Um, so that does happen, and I think that we could point kids in those directions as we, that's an area we could improve upon, is saying this program and this program make a nice blend if you're looking at these careers. I'm not sure we articulate that well. The so. reason I asked that is that, you know, I met that young man a few years ago, mm -hmm. and he went for automotive his first year, but then he wanted to be a realtor, right. and then he wanted to flip houses. So if we had like, kind of discovered that before he started, he could have done building trades right. where he can make improvements on flipping houses, right. but also maybe get into marketing, mm -hmm. video production, that sort of advertising, right. and then he knows how to market his business and the houses that he's flipping. Right. So I was just curious, if it, is it like a trend where most kids are like, yeah, I thought I wanted this, but really, and eh, I'm a senior, I want to switch in a whole different direction. That's all. I well, and I, and I think the question is, is this a high school student or is this a tech center student? You know, right. because I think, we try to do career exploration right from the get-go with them so that mm -hmm. they can f learn fairly early on if that's a path they want to pursue. Um, but I think that there is room to grow in terms of what we do with freshmen and sophomores in our ascending districts. Right. I think that could help that cool. a lot. That's a good idea. Yep. Um, let's see here. So as I mentioned earlier, the proficiency work has really guided um, our professional development and it's been really helpful in, I think, at least what Gary and I have talked about in terms of like partner schools understanding what kids are graduating with from our program so that they can plan their freshman and sophomore years a little bit more succinctly. 
what is really challenging is when kids come to us not on track to graduate and we don't offer the courses that they need. Um, it produces a bit of a, a challenge to us. So a lot of independent projects or independent work and um, online coursework, <laughs> essentially, which I don't think is their best way of learning. So. Um, all right. Um, the faculty and staff were surveyed along with a bunch of other people and in looking at all of the surveys there was some um, really good things to hear. So one thing that the majority of the staff felt was that we have a positive school culture, um, that we have a supportive and helpful administration, and that the resources they need to do a good job are there. So that's positive in my mind. Um, our whole staff has a wealth of industry knowledge. I think where the gaps lie are with, in our own systems with how we do our mentor program, how we onboard staff members. These people are coming from industry and it's overwhelming to all of a sudden learn to teach while teaching um, because they're going to school to learn this stuff at the same time. So this year we did a more um, articulate sort of orientation with everybody and I think it was much better and I felt as though staff members walked in the first week really knowing, um, feeling more secure and, and knowing what they needed to do. So that was, that was a good change. Um, so I think staff reported that student behavior and we all kind of felt that I think last year was one of the issues that was uh, impacting them feeling a little bit overwhelmed and so we had secured ESSER 3 funds to support uh, the Gary's position uh, for two years and that's amazing because I feel like we finally have enough support in the building to have one of us be able to focus on teaching and learning in terms of like supervision evaluation and the sort of bigger global picture and one of us dealing with the day-to-day -day student discipline issues and um, so so far that's been amazing and I already mentioned the academics thing and one of the questions that was asked was how how do the students can the students relate to the teachers I guess in some sort of way it was, it was sort of like that and essentially or can they see themselves in the teacher and we have really I think hired an amazing new staff here and some of these staff members are RTCC students or have attended another career tech center so I feel like their story is so important for the kids to understand and hear and it's kind of inspiring for them so I absolutely feel that way that we have um, kind of gotten a staff on board that can really help kids overcome barriers and um, make a different future for themselves than maybe what they had imagined. One of the things, the questions is, what would make you leave? And so really, there's a couple things, couple parts to this. One, it all centered around pay. And right now, the way the contract is written, tech teachers, their years of service in the industry do not equal one year of service in education. Um, and even if they were in education, like if I had come from Hartford having nine years, or whatever I had, 11 years of teaching experience, I would only have five and a half on the scale here because of the way the language is written. So I think um, that is one thing that industry folks, you know, there's quite a discrepancy when they come here. Um, so that's something we need to look at and address in our next contract. Uh, professional development, you know, I think I mentioned what we're doing this year. Um, just kind of some perspective. I think when COVID hit, uh, we were all just kind of in survival mode the first year. We were dealing with, you know, working hybrid, and I think we had everything we could handle. We did work a little bit on career trees and recruitment and retention that year, but that was about the size of it. Everything else was just centered around how do we how do we do right by these kiddos that are here for a tech program and half the time they're at home <laughs> so um, that was that year 21 22 we had a, a fairly large amount of staff turnover you know that was last year and I think what we found with PD was it was really just responding to their needs and trying to kind of get everybody onboarded 
Um, this year, we do have some s substantial PD planned, and I think we mitigated that need for new teachers to have that in-depth stuff during the year by how we oriented them at the beginning of the year. So I feel like we're heading in the right direction, and it's improving. Uh, faculty have said that what they valued most was time spent with other colleagues around the state in other CTE centers. So that's something we need to look at as well. Um, in terms of professional development that they want, they talked about equity training, emotional intelligence, media literacy, and visits to other CTE centers. Um, I think, if anything, last year I think helped us all realize that equity training is something we all really need to put a focus on in our building. Um, and I guess, you know, other than that, the Gary's trying to secure, or has secured Castleton to get uh, college credits for staff members for the PD that we're doing in-house. And that's a, the goal is to help them to meet their responsibilities for licensure um, and making it a little bit easier for them to do that rather than having to go take something somewhere else. They can get credit for the work that we are doing as a team. So, yeah, let's see here. Equity. <coughs> This is a big number. 40 to 50% of our students are on plans. Okay, just think about that for a minute. So 40 to 50% of our students are on IEPs, 504s, and ESTs. Um, but the thing is, is it's really comparable to a lot of the other CTE centers around Vermont. 1% um, or less than 1% of our student body is from the BIPOC community and 0% of our teaching staff. So we are, are not terribly diverse, um, but with that said, I'm, I'm thinking that we reflect our local community. So I, I don't think it's a lack of us recruiting those folks. I think it's just the nature of where we live and, and the community that we live in. Um, we do need to work on advanced manufacturing, recruiting females as students. Um, right now, they, they have not had a stu female student in that program for quite a few years. And as I mentioned earlier, the health careers, dental, and education for us to look at recruiting boys. Um, when we talked about standardized tests, so I'm not gonna go over that again. Um, I think our promotional materials do promote diversity, like just our front cover. We have a female in construction trades um, on the front cover. I'm probably going to change that this year to a different student, but um, the idea that we try to represent every, everybody through that promotional material I think is there. <laughs> and then uh, just in terms of career exploration, which is what we already talked about, the pre-tech exploratory program is helpful in career exploration. Um, we also use the TFS career trees, which I mentioned earlier, which allows kids to research different careers in their pathway. We administer the ASVAB so that kids can find their um, strengths. We have a subscription currently for youth science for them to discover their aptitudes and interests. And then, again, for career uh, exploration sort of more globally, we offer tours to kiddos. Anyone that wants to come to the center, I'm happy to walk them around with their class. I did it with a fourth grade class last year. We did it with all of the ninth graders last year. Um, and I think there's room to grow that. And then I hope that our middle school camp will grow as well. <clears throat> so I think that's our last slide. I'm gonna get out of present mode. So while Felicia gets out of present mode, um, are there any questions? I have a question about the camp. What, is, what does that look like? Well, uh, <laughs> a lot of fun according yeah. to Facebook. Yeah, it was. I saw some videos. It, it looks was. pretty fun. Uh, so. Yeah, so we had what did we have? 10, 10 kiddos this year. So we started small. We worked with um, Heidi and the town to they they provided this the staffing component, the pay, even though it was our staff, and then we had the supplies out of Perkins, and um, they explored four different areas, I believe. We had health careers, we had criminal justice and cybersecurity, we had auto, and then we had Gary who did like a metal working. And um, the kids' parents every day would be like, they're coming home and they're having a blast. So it was really, good. really successful. Yeah. And we just need to grow it. I think teachers, more teachers need to be on board and we can, you know, 
maybe make the time in each program a little less. But yeah, what, what's the time? We commitment? did it all day. All day for? The entire summer? We did, no, for one week. For oh. One week. Yeah. So what, like, yeah. did they do all four things? So they did day? all four things, and then in the middle of the day, they went to the pool. Yeah. And that, the camp staff did that part, lunch and the pool time with them. But And can I share about what, what Lance did? Yeah. Um, the video instructor taught for four weeks at the elementary school providing uh, programming for students <clears throat> kindergarten through uh, six, primarily working with kids f grades four to six, but some of the youngers as well. And that's where I think those videos came from yeah. because I still have students saying to me when I go out to them ele elementary school, will you run a, the, an after school program? Mm -hmm. So getting at that young age to work with yeah. a tech instructor mm -hmm. like sparked them. Mm -hmm. So I think we should do more at the elementary level next year. <coughs> I think it was really a good partnership. I think that's a good segue for what I was going to ask. Is mm -hmm. there any programs that students wish that we offered? Is yes. there another category <coughs> that we don't that we should explore in the next few years? Mm -hmm. For example, podcasting is becoming very popular again. Well, again, but it's getting even more popular. I've even had coworkers leave the job where I work to start their own podcast. Mm -hmm. It's all about how to talk, how to speech, how to edit. Is there stuff like that that are showing interest for younger people, live streaming, whatever, that we can help set them up with skills to? Well, I think um, it's interesting that you say that because I, prior to consolidating the graphics program and the video program into the program that Lance now teaches, mm -hmm. I, uh, I had a lot of parents asking about broadcasting. And so that is one component of his curriculum, but I don't know if he does podcasts or not. Okay. It's weird because when I, back in 90s, you'd actually go to college for communications and broadcasting and learning how to present yourself, and it kind of faded, right? And now we're seeing it come back as a need, and, and not just for radio or traditional media, but even just you know, you're on YouTube and you're live streaming or you're making a video or you're, mm -hmm. you know, so I just see a shift and I see a lot of interest in younger people. Um, is that, you know, is that something that would drive more people, you know, juniors and seniors, like, I want to do this. This is going to set me up so when I'm ready to go independent or join another company, I can do it. That, I, so yeah. is there anything like that anything, besides that? Yeah. I mean, I think the, the one that I really think is a need that's been expressed is um, plumbing and heating. Mm -hmm. I have been reached out to in terms of like animal science and vet tech mm -hmm. as a need. Oh, um, that is a need. Oh, and world. ophthalmology. Oh, that's in a bad spot right now. Yeah. <laughs> they need a lot of those people. <laughs> so. Talking to eye care for you just last week. Thanks. Yeah, <laughs> Dr. Barslow actually when I was in there, he's like, you work at the tech center, what can you do for us? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, um, throw it out there but yeah we well can't... I'm in the community a lot too and I get feedback and I tell people I'm on the RTCC board and it's some of the businesses say like I just don't feel a lot of times the kids are graduating with what they need to be an auto mechanic yes. and I tell them well step up and give us feedback yeah. so mm -hmm. yep. do we also send out questionnaires to people that might employ kids once they graduate like they're their um, level of knowledge, um, where we could improve on that. Do we do anything like a poll, I guess? Of, of employers, that's a really good idea. No, yeah. uh, we haven't. Just to get feedback like, oh, like, it'd be nice for them to start off knowing how to do oil changes and tire changeovers first, right. where they might feel like they're, a group of the kids are lacking how to do that skill when they first yeah. come out, you know. Um, and I think a lot of it, you know, it depends on the kid, yep. it, and it, it depends too on the oversight with their work-based learning. I think um, sometimes the placements didn't know what they needed, what their responsibilities were necessarily. Right. So I think that articulating that would really help. Um, I know that Jeremy is going to be going out every like two weeks. He's going to go to every placement. So I think we're building that relationship with the, the businesses now that maybe hasn't been there. Um, yep. And well, I think that'll come. And I know like Vermont Castings, I, I'm pretty in with them. And I was just talking and like, you know, it's great to get kids to come here and work and try it out, mm -hmm. but also get back a little bit to the center and give feedback and um, even like what type of equipment you're using now so they can be maybe 
you know, brought that as a learning curve while at school. So it's not so new when they come out. They actually have, like, if it's CNC machines, okay, we need a program on, on how to operate CNC machines, how to program them. What do we need for these kids so when they come out there? And that's trained. one piece I think I somehow skipped over in the presentation, but there are areas of our programming that need new equipment. Yep. We were there, and um, luckily we secured Brian Kippen for our industrial design and fabrication, and he's already like, yep, I'm going to be raising thousands of dollars in the next X amount of time, and we're going to get this place up to date. Um, so I think he's got enough business you know, connections to make that happen. Um, but also, he runs a business, and so we can go see what a modern shop looks like. Right. And even some uh, shops will be getting rid of aged equipment, which mm -hmm. might be only two or three years old, right. but if it but somehow can be donated or it can be, like, looked over to make sure it's safe for the kids, mm -hmm. and then they can have at least some hands-on on semi-newer equipment. That Absolutely. might be, like I said, like, talking to the industries, like, give back. Like, mm -hmm. are you throwing away equipment that could be used that help these kids that we don't have to dip into a budget and just right. kind of have that. I think it goes back to another piece that's just the strength of our advisory boards. We need right. to have really strong program advisory boards and that's why. Gotcha. That's a piece of it. You know. Well, Jeremy's not shy so I think he's going to fill that, yeah. <laughs> that, that position quite well. Yeah, so. I think so too. Excellent. Any other yeah. questions for me? I have two. Sure. Um, so is this a yearly report? It is not. So when Perkins 5 came out, this was a requirement of Perkins 5 to have a CLNA report that happened in 2020. And it was, to say the least, kind of disorganized with a, not a lot of guidelines. Okay. And so I was under the impression, at least from that point, that the two-year would be just kind of like a, you know, tweak. Here's some things that have changed, like a little bit of, you know, not, not a major deal. It ended up being a full-fledged another CLNA, like more in-depth with, like, really clear expectations for what we needed to look at. So this will be repeated every two years, is what I, you're saying? I'm thinking they're going to, now that they've got a system in place, I think it's going to be every two years. Okay. Um, and then will there be, uh, so that's an external utilization of the findings, like the data trending, yep. Yep. what they're seeing, and then how, what that investment will be back into this facility? Exactly. So they, okay. so they look at it not only for if it's meeting state and federal program quality standards, but they're looking at it for whether it will be eligible for Perkins funding. Got it. Okay. Yep. So um, here on our agenda, you're looking for an approval from us? I am, just an approval of the findings that I've just um, stated to you. I need to be able to give that to um, the Vermont Agency of Ed. So can I have a motion to approve um, Felicia's report? Sure. So is there any more comments before we vote? Okay. All in favor of the motion to approve the CLNA as presented? Please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Fantastic. So I believe, Lane, that you shared your superintendent report already. Um, was there anything additionally, Felicia, that you wanted to share or anything about the financials? Um, not at this time. No, I think the we're, financials you, look good. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> typically, you look at, you know, they should be spending about 8.3% per month. Um, I, I looked at yours. You've only, if I remember correctly, you've only spent about eight percent, and we're two two yeah. months into the year, so yeah. they're they're in really good. We shape. tend to be kind of right on target. It yeah. seems like. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we're just, you know, really the only thing is getting this Perkins funding approved. Um, that pays for a lot of the IRCs. Um, it pays for our Vermont Works for Women. So there's like some of those other things that we do come through that funding. Um, but okay. And a portion of a couple of positions. <coughs> okay, uh, our next order of business is the consent agenda, which includes the minutes from our May 11th meeting. Um, hopefully you all saw those. They were mailed. If I could get a motion to approve the minutes. Sure. Thank you, <laughs> Sam. <laughs> Perhaps a second, Nathan? Second. Thank you. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Any opposed? 
All right. Is there any other business to bring forth at this time? I don't think I have any. Any members here? Lane, anything? Thank you. Thank you for awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Good job, Felicia. Thank you all. It's been a, been, a, been a good start. It's been a great start to the year. Especially after the last three with COVID. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's so awesome to hear. Yeah. yeah, it's been refreshing to feel. It feels more yeah. like kind of normal. what it used to feel like to yeah. be in education. <laughs> yeah. Same. Yeah. yeah. All right. With no further business and just a lot of accolades for the good work, um, we will see you all on November 9th. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Let's get that in. I know. I'm putting mine in right now.